Okay, thank you very much. And yes, I would like to apologize because um, due to some unforeseen circumstances, I had to a little bit uh, compress my, my, my talk today. But I still want to present to you this um, winner mix with cloud functions and micro frontends uh, for an architecture smoothie. Uh, again, like uh, our colleagues presented, I am Natalia Bendito, I am from Uruguay. Um, I am a web uh, and Angular um, uh, Google developer expert. And I work as a principal software engineer and front-end architect for one of the largest clients at Netcentric. And I really, really want to keep you cool with this cloud presentation today. So if you read the outline for this talk, you know we will propose some requirements of and post to, I don't know, enterprise scale software like high performance, uh, localization, multiple endpoints. Um, but are those requirements only for enterprise platforms and applications? Uh, this talk will be definitely useful for developers that have not yet had the chance to work in a cloud native setup in an enterprise context. But I believe that the ones that may benefit the most may be smaller agencies and startups uh, trying to become maybe more competitive through their infrastructure. So what I'm going to aim at doing today is to debunk the myths that um, in order to leverage the amazing opportunities that cloud introduces, you need to be at, uh, in an enterprise context. Like you have to be part of a large enterprise team working in delivering enterprise uh, platforms. Let's ask or let's start by, by asking ourselves this question. Are problems solved by enterprise solutions very different than the ones that need to be solved by smaller scale websites? And, and if they are, can we approximate them? Can we compare them and put them together and try to extract whatever is common to both? In my opinion, a smoothie is a smoothie. doesn't matter the size of the cup or uh, the flavor. And web software solutions oftentimes are or tend to have very uh, similar problems to solve. And when we're talking about cloud, even more so. So when you finally do this migration, when you finally move yourself to the cloud and start trying to, to solve problems from the cloud, those differences are even less and less evident, except for the size, of course. And I don't mean the size of the solution, also the size of the team, the size of the budget, the size of the risk. Um, when I started working as a developer in a small agency, that was way too long ago, uh, things were super, super different. We had to pick up a, a CMS and specialize with it. Um, in my case, or in our case, it was PHP, and it was connected to my uh, MySQL da database, or you could only connect to MySQL databases only. We had no time, we had no skills, nor dedicated resources to hook our own templates to preview components and modules. So usually we had to, you know, use what was available from the community. I can tell you that I used to work mostly with Drupal, so I would go to the Drupal community and see what was available to solve my problems. And the result was usually a myriad of different, yet very static, HTML output with a spaghetti of naming conventions, of uh, patterns, of ways of doing things in the in the in the when it came to styling, styles looked all different. There was no pattern or methodology whatsoever, so it was not very clean and it was not very easy to maintain and it was not very easy to understand either. Because the backend was PHP and the databases were uh, MySQL. Uh, or had to be MySQL, we had to find adapted hosting providers and we had to learn to use them. And I remember uh, scouting the internet for uh, hosting providers that had cPanel because it was the easiest way to work, for me at least. Uh, but sometimes the clients didn't want to, to, to pay the, 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 that for that particular provider, they were not happy, they had another one in mind. So it was, it was really, really uh, challenging. And I don't even want to mention how we used to store the code and version the code and deploy the code. Um, we simply had no advanced knowledge 
uh, and setting up all that back in the day was extremely, extremely complex. So keeping things up to date was a real, real challenge. Um, life, was, life was really tough for us at that time and it was insecure and it was also very inflexible and hard to keep up with you know, changes if you wanted to change anything in that infrastructure that was so um, tightly coupled, it was almost or near impossible. But even then, problems to solve were almost identical. This is something I can tell you. So what are those layers that represent the domains of problems to solve within a software solution? No matter if it's a tiny website or web app, or it's a large platform serving hundreds of them, if it's a cloud or if it's a horror setup like the one I just showed you, you will need to have an infrastructure setup, in which are the servers, the network, etc. You also need a layer that takes care of the business logic, whether it's a classic backend or it's serverless. And no matter the size of your solution, I guarantee you will need to connect to a third party API. And it's likely, likely you will need to connect to, to several dozens endpoints. And finally, what I, as a front-end architect, consider the most interesting, the sweet topping for this smoothie analogy, is the front-end, right? The UI or the user-facing technologies that guarantee um, a great user experience, uh, return in, on investment for your clients, and also loyalty for, from your, your, your users, right? Because if they're happy with how they experience a website, a platform, an app, or any um, of these experiences, they, they will come back. But that's merely an outline. There are so many more things to solve for solution architects. Uh, you need to um, decide on the tech stack. You need to decide on the patterns. You need to decide on the frameworks to use, uh, the build systems, the dependency management, the continuous integration and development and release models. And I am not even going to mention, okay, I, I am mentioning already, security, performance, observability, analytics, targeting, etc. There are so many things in the scope that it's, it's, it becomes burdensome at, at times. Those decisions are also influenced by three important factors, not exclusively, but they probably have the most weight. One, it's time or deadlines, how much time you have to complete, uh, to complete this, um, money, what is the budget to support this delivery, this development? And also teams. And when I say teams, I say, uh, or I mean team size, team seniority, time zones, communication skills, leadership skills, who is leading us into successfully delivering this. And I really wanted to mention them because they should be considered very much at the time of making decisions, whether you want to you know, stay on premise, uh, work with a monolith or you want to move to the cloud. Now let's go back to the cloud idea and map all those ingredients to cloud features. I am not, I am not here to advocate for any particular vendor in, in this talk. There are several options in the market and probably the ones with the largest ecosystems are, are the ones you see in the slide. Um, AWS or Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud, all with a set of amazing features and options and plans as well. Um, however, in order to make references more clear, I will use Amazon Web Services products as example. So we mentioned earlier before how um, small agencies and startups offering software development service can really, really benefit and become very competitive by leveraging cloud platforms, but they need to understand very well uh, what the free tier or the lower cost tiers for each service provider offer because there are differences and maybe you think, okay, I have it all, all covered with this plan and then you realize you have to um, subscribe to more, to more uh, services or products. And you also, if you're in this, like if you're a, 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 a person making decisions, um, you probably want to make sure uh, to be offered hosting and storage, obviously, for dynamic and static apps, because static, uh, static apps are uh, taking a lot of relevance lately. Serverless computing, also known as functions, databases, and yeah, 
and maybe you want also, I don't know, um, artificial intelligence or something like this, but this is for more complex applications, for more complex functionalities. So let's start mapping the layers to actual cloud options and see what we have at our disposal. The first batch of issues we're going to solve with cloud that is common to all web solu solution mixes are those connected to hosting. And by hosting in the cloud, you have out of the box access to, for example, H2, uh, HTTP2 protocol, right? Which it's um, desirable most sites or more applications move on to uh, in the future. We are already, uh, or we have it already available for five years or so, but I think the, the, the percentage of sites on HTTP2 still not 50%. And we can also forget about latency because serving, serving uh, from the cloud, you are serving from a distributed network that ensures uh, you don't face those issues. So if your user is in South America, for example, like in the picture, and, um, and you have only the servers in Europe, then your this user is going to have to wait a lot of time for this data to arrive. But if you're in a distributed network like cloud is, um, it's going to be served probably from a server close to the user. And all cloud services offer state-of-the-art caching and load balancing, balancing, and these perks will very much increase your performance scores, right? And of course, we will reduce the bill on infrastructure setup and maintenance exponentially by not having to deal with this on-premise including the bill for securing that infrastructure, a bill you obviously don't want to skip. When going to the cloud or cloud, we're going to leave behind those monolithic backend implementations that we're used to, and we will be more interested in fragmenting it right into multiple independent microservices, each one exposing its own API. We also know uh, or I am sure you know and you have faced this before, that apart from the services that you create, that you may develop custom to your, to, to, to suit your needs or the needs of your clients, your requirements, you will very likely need to integrate a myriad of third-party APIs. I'm talking about cookie management, I'm talking about maps, about user localization services, about localization services, for um, several languages, payment, user authentication, authorization, well, amongst other third parties, right? And um, all of those are very likely to need to be integrated. And you are going to want to streamline all of those requests. You are going to want to have them like centralized. And for that, cloud services provide API management through a single point of entry in order to organize and secure requests and responses, especially those carrying uh, sensitive data as payload, like user information, um, payment information, etc. Once we have an infrastructure and network more efficient for global consumption, like it's on CDN, we have an API gateway, um, we have also delegated our business logic to serverless computing, and we have organized our API connections through this API gateway, we can proceed with the mix. Of course, now we have a bunch of microservices instead of one monolith architecture, and what validates this decision, right? This depends on, well, it depends if it's enterprise or not, because if it's enterprise, in my opinion, you may want to have microservices probably when multiple features of an application are developed by independent cross-functional teams, particularly when they have release cycles that are uh, based on the need to update or continue to develop new functionality. If you're working as a unique small team, you still may want to encapsulate services and make them as generic as possible because that will probably help you reduce time and efforts and costs if you maintain your own libraries and have them ready to plug in and reuse uh, and reuse them across many projects. And if you have uh, split your business logic into individual encapsulated mini backends that can be independently installed or deployed, you probably also want to have an independent front end, right, for each one of them. So each one of those micro front ends could be built with the use of a completely different front end technology or framework 
And you could have service A use Angular, like I am representing them with colors over there, and service B use React, and then um, service, I don't know, C use Vue, and you could have them all bootstrapped to the same HTML page, of course, if your performance budget allows. Now, micro frontends are probably the fanciest smoothie right now. Everyone is talking about micro frontends, and every everyone wants them, and everyone thinks they're better than anything else that ever that we've ever seen before. But let me clarify from a yeah front end architect per perspective that I only believe this is partially true, which means micro front ends are good, providing you need them and you are ready for them, right? Micro front ends don't make sense if you have a single team and components are very tightly coupled. And um, they may make real sense when you have multiple teams taking care of different features that map for different domains, if we are thinking of a domain-driven kind of architecture. And you have a good strategy, strategy sorry, to share commonalities between these micro front ends in a way that they are easily cacheable. Like if you have, um, if you use utilities or if you um, consume utilities that are exactly the same, you have dependencies that are exactly the same from micro front end one and micro front end three, you probably want to remove that from each one of those um, encapsulated micro frontends and take it to a place where they can be consumed as dependency and they can be maintained only once. So if you package your commons and upload them to the to NPM following semantic versioning, for example, and are able to use them as extracted dependency, then you probably have a case for micro frontends. If you're part of a single small team and you still want to delve into the depths of micro front ends, one plausible solution would be to use a mono repository pattern, for example, with Angular, that's possible, and bundle each application as a micro front end. You also need to pay extreme attention to the dependencies, especially Node, the Node version, the Angular core version, the Angular CLI version, and probably you want to compile them all with the same compiler to avoid issues. You can push this idea further by implementing each one of the micro frontends as standalone Angular elements. So Angular elements are basically Angular components packaged as custom HTML elements that implement the web components API as a web standard. The browser will register each one of them as a custom element registry, mapping an instance of a JavaScript class to an HTML tag. So each one of those red um, squares represent an HTML tag that instantiate a JavaScript class. Each of those elements make uh, or make all the required Angular infrastructure available to the browser. So as described in the code snippet you can see on top, the create custom element function creates a custom element class based on an Angular component. And what's the benefit of this? Whether you work in separate teams, maintaining multiple services independently uh, with independent release cycles and you work in a small team um, uh, maintaining a few different client applications, for example, if you, if you package your elements separately, you can reuse those components, you can version them, you can update them, you can install them, you can remove them and replace them without affecting the whole ecosystem of your application. Okay, so now we have a few layers under control and migrated to the cloud pattern. Now we only have to think of a content management system. Content management systems typically um, integrate a CRUD interface for the authors to create, edit, and delete content, an API to get and post this content to a database. So you obviously need that database as well. And finally, another API to serve the content back to the user. There are plenty of open source um, proprietary options that can be integrated depending on the use case and needs. And one such example could be Contentful. And we will expand on this headless CMS uh, idea in a moment. So until now, we are giving an outline and talking about layers or concerns, but let's start giving things 
cloud names to better define our architecture. Like I said, I am not recommending any option of cloud provider in particular because they all have pros and cons, like I mentioned earlier, and they all provide amazing solutions, and which one suits you best will depend on your specific needs. But I feel it is easier to understand um, cloud if we map functionalities to their commercial item um, names, sorry. Um, because we have heard them many times, perhaps. So I will use, uh, again, AWS as an example and also put uh, names to other ingredients of this recipe. This is a real life diagram of a cloud implementation. And as you can see, we have the browser, right? That hits the content distribution network first. And in this case, um, we can call it CloudFront. That's the, the offer from um, AWS, where everything is cached to make it super fast. And again, this is distributed, so probably close to the user that makes this request. Uh, for enterprise scale solutions, you're also likely to find a load balancer in the middle in order to better distribute requests that go past this, this first cache. A bit deeper in the guts of the cloud, we find the API gateway connecting us to this myriad of microservices handled by our serverless microservices functions. And let's take the content service as an example because we were talking about uh, contentful and headless CMS. In this particular case, we offer the, the CRUD or the CRUD via an instance of contentful and um, I, I happened to come across not long ago, like two weeks ago, somebody who didn't know what the headless CMS was. And it's nothing but a um, CMS that doesn't have a, an inbuilt front end. So you have the CRUD for the authors to create the content, to edit it, to publish it, but you don't have a representation in the front end that is fixed. You can build your own front end with whatever technology you want. So um, this means that the authors have a, an optimal content authoring experience and your front end view is completely flexible. And in order to store this content, we set up, a, in this case, a Dynamo database and connect to it via a GraphQL API with an Apollo client in the middle. So in this case, our front end is an Angular application and uh, we have spinned a GitLab instance in the cloud to handle atomic deployments and continuous integration pipelines that you know, put all this HTML, all this generated output, JavaScripts and uh, assets to an S3 bucket. An S3 bucket is basically that a storage, a simple storage um, system uh, where you deploy all your artifacts to. It would be rather impossible to implement all this in the few minutes we have left in this presentation, but this talk is to give you ideas and invite you to research. And there are plenty of resources online to help you get started up and running with cloud and serverless. However, I would like to discuss a few items a bit more. First of all, one of the most interesting features of cloud is cloud or um, is serverless computing, sorry, also known as functions. Uh, in the case of AWS, it's Lambda functions, and all main cloud providers offer editors to quickly design and implement your functions. So functions, like mentioned before, allow you to, to drop those large and necessary monolith backend implementations in favor of single responsibility functions. It is very easy to scale up if you need, and if you don't, necess and if you don't need um, to use them, you don't need to compute, this time doesn't represent a cost. So you don't necessarily need to pay tons of money to have serverless computing, especially when there is low traffic. So you pay for the computing time only, and this is why I believe it is very, very interesting for consultants outside of the enterprise context. If you've never seen uh, one, if you've never seen a, um, a serverless function, um, or you don't know what it looks like, it looks like any backend code of your language of choice. You can choose to write your functions in Node.js, in Python, in Java, in C Sharp. Regardless of the language, they're written in um, the, these Lambda functions have a handler, right? A, they have logging capabilities. They also have a context with methods and utilities. 
like for example in this case content function name which is invoking this method within the context and finally they have also a deployment package which is a bundle of your function and your dependencies ready to deploy so serverless functions can be invoked from a pipeline execution uh, using events, using webhooks or action rules defined in a YAML file, in a configuration file, and pipelines can be monitored and secured via roles and permissions. So for each one of these activities, you will find a service. In the case of AWS, you have CloudWatch, uh, which is kind of a developer tool in the cloud, and YAM to define security and access policies. If you're familiar with other platform-based uh, delivery systems, like, I don't know, the, the Jamstack-based Netlify or GitHub Pages, you know one of the most loved features is the continuous development and integration seamless pipelines. So you, you have your code, you push to develop or you merge a pull request to develop in GitHub, and suddenly you see a build running in the Netlify uh, console. You can totally integrate your existing repos in GitHub or even Bitbucket, I believe. I, I am not sure, but I think yes, probably the, the, the main providers for um, code hosting um, with most of these cloud providers platforms. So uh, process is usually quite straightforward and you will have all your code available as well as um, dedicated tools to configure, build and deployment pipelines. And I, um, I really, really wish I had uh, this back in the day when I was pushing zip folders down the FTP uh, internet pipes. So the truth is, no matter uh, the, the composition of your team or what processes you follow, if you're agile or not, having a well-designed continuous integration and delivery pipe, pipeline is quite vital. I think it's one of the most important aspects of team development right now. It's especially important if you're splitting your software in domains and assigning teams to each domain because you want to have that really in sync and you want to make sure that you integrate things very, very seam seamlessly, especially if whatever is de being developed in Team A is a dependency of whatever is developed in Team B, right? Um, so you really need very well-designed uh, release models. So if you want to have full control over these release models and the most control over your CDCI in the, in the cloud, you can think of spinning a GitLab server in the cloud to suit your needs and design it in any way you want. For all three cloud services mentioned, GitLab is ready to install from their marketplaces, uh, but you have to keep in mind that exactly because it's pre-configured, it has dependencies in additional services that you may need to subscribe um, with, an, an, with an additional cost, I suppose. So you will need um, SSH keys, you will need SSL certificates, you will need a dedicated domain and um, relational database. For Azure, for example, you need to deploy a new virtual machine and for AWS, you will need a, an additional S3 bucket for all the artifacts. But I can guarantee you, because I work in a similar context, that is very, very worth it. The most important part is that you can automate your pipeline via Lambda or uh, functions in order to automate the publication of your packages on a certain event, for example. Uh, for, like, I don't know, you decide which branch is your base, and whenever there is um, an integration to this, to this branch, everything will get deployed. The same automation process can bump versions in the context of a uh, semantic versioning strategy, and then application shell developers only have to update the version in their packages, like in their package JSON, for example, to consume the most up-to-date release. Once you have all those very important aspects of your infrastructure figured out, you can even simplify your life by replicating environments and code as infrastructure with the help of Terraform. I say simplify because this is the goal, but Terraform is mm, it's really a hot tool, but it's also a complex tool. So the important thing is to know how it may help you. You will need to figure out how to exactly use it and implement it. So you have 
pipelines and, and workflows that work for you and you want to reproduce them, let's say you have your development infra set up and want to duplicate it with the chance of um, reconfiguring it for, I don't know, UAT or for production, and even for local development, for your local uh, develop for your, sorry, developers to have a local setup. And Terraform will help you manage all that. So you will be able to share configurations, scale up and version your environments and automate provisioning from a single management tool. So in sum, what are the final flavors for our smoothie mix? If we decide to go with cloud, we will enjoy reduced costs in infrastructure setup and maintenance. Um, we have, or it will be much easier for us to scale up. It will be much faster to deploy. We will have zero to none downtime because even if we crash or if our code crashes, our functions, crash, there will be no downtime. Um, we will have absolute and complete flexibility, the ability to choose all the technologies in the stack. Of course, we will be limited by products, like we said before, but um, if you want to have a REST API, you can do it. If you want to have a GraphQL API, you can still have it. And if you want to have both as well, you can also decide how your infrastructure looks like. Well, we, which leads in the end to a great developer experience since we are not no longer restricted. We can spin any CMS, we can, like I use Contentful as an example, but any CMS could be a headless CMS right now, WordPress, Drupal, even the proprietary Adobe Experience Manager. We can use, like said, Restore or GraphQL, we can go MySQL database or Dynamo or whatever we want. And we can choose from a whole market of third-party integrations to cover authentication, localization, and other needs. And finally, because of enhanced CD and CI tools, we don't need to restrict, our, restrict ourselves and our clients to inflexible and extended release models. Like, I don't know, we do a sprint that lasts three weeks and you cannot integrate anything until then. We can basically integrate any changes at any time and roll back very, very easily if things go wrong. So this is it. Thank you very much. I um, am at your disposal on social media and to discuss serverless, to discuss how it affects front-end development and to discuss how um, front-end architects are right now a great part of designing these cloud architectures and making decisions, making decisions in this uh, cloud um, world. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and your session. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And I hope that it was useful. And again, I hope to stay connected to everyone attending the conference. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.